Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to answer your gardening questions. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the State Master Gardener Specialist for the Master Gardener Program here in Illinois. I live here in central Illinois, and flowers are my thing. I love to grow flowers. Um, I, I would love to introduce my colleagues today, too, which grow different things that they like to grow. Yeah, so I'm Ryan Panko, horticulture educator right here in Champaign-Urbana, and uh, you know my specialty is woody plants, trees, shrubs, all those, all those kind of things. I also like native plants. I also am a vegetable gardener and, and mm -hmm. grow quite a few vegetables every year. So, awesome. Hi, I'm Jen Nelson, former colleague of these guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a horticulturist as well. Uh, my favorite thing is vegetable gardening, house plants. Um, kind of general horticulture nerd. Cool. Uh, you can find me online at groundedandgrowing.com. And hopefully we get some good questions tonight. We brought lots of stuff to show. Yeah, we sure did. Yeah, so if you have gardening questions, feel free to start adding those into the chat box here, and we're going to answer those as we go through today. Uh, but if you've watched our show before, you know we kind of pick a topic uh, every week lately. And this week our topic is seed starting. So we're all inside this time of year. We can't be gardening outside, obviously. So we kind of start dreaming of what's to come out in the garden. So we brought a bunch of different stuff to talk about and some different seed starting topics. So mm -hmm. what do you want to kick us off maybe a little bit about kind of timing? Like when, when do you start seeds inside? Yeah, when so... You know, you, you've got to figure out when to start these seeds inside mm -hmm. because you don't want mature plants ready before it's too warm outside, mm -hmm. and you don't mm -hmm. you don't want to be so late in the season that you know your mm -hmm. your plants are too tiny to really do much once right. they get out there. So, uh, the way you kind of figure that out is by looking at the the average you know frost free date mm -hmm. for your area. Mm -hmm. So you, that's you, you hear that term a lot, frost mm -hmm. free date. Um, we were talking off air before the show that um, this is an average. You know, it's <laughs> not a guarantee. So. And it's based off of, you know, long-term weather data. Yeah. Um, yep. And so, you know, for Central Illinois, I always say, you know, that's about April 15th to May 1st is kind of that average, you know, frost-free date. And, you know, to be on the conservative side, I always kind of think of like May 1st-ish as yeah. your, sure. you know, your mm -hmm. date where you're going to want to put out some of those cold-sensitive plants. And so we, we just shared a map of the state, um, accessible online. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. You know, you can take a look at that and find your area, and it lists, you know, the date of the average last frost mm -hmm. there, and so that'll change a little bit up and down the state, mm -hmm. you know. I think we said before about two weeks for difference between north and south mm -hmm. uh, from yep. here. So yep. if you're, you know, in northern Illinois, that's probably about two weeks difference um, later in the year, and yep. if you're in southern Illinois, that's two weeks sooner, but um, check that out for your area. So that's how you know when, when your deadline is for having seedlings ready. So then... You just count back the weeks or days, mm -hmm. um, always weeks, uh, to when you start things. So um, if you have a seed packet uh, for any of the plants that you like to grow, um, it says right on the back, you know, a lot of the different requirements for this plant, but also says, you know, how many weeks to start it indoors on, a, on all of these mm -hmm. little seed packets. Yeah, so there's a lot of great information there. So that's, that's in a nutshell how you kind of figure out when to start plants. Very good, very good. So, so what are some of those earliest things that you guys tend to start? If you're going to start something inside, what are some of the things you usually do? Um, broccoli would be one that you'd start yeah, really one early of the earliest. because it goes out pretty early. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Broccoli, I mean, I think of other kind of cold tolerant things like uh, spinach and kale. Mm -hmm. You could start early because they're, you know, they thrive in that cooler part of the season. When you get into the hot part of summer, yeah. you know, it's really hard yeah. for them to be very productive because they yeah. don't like the hotter weather. So. Yeah. Absolutely, so. absolutely. And I don't grow any vegetables. So I'll let you guys <laughs> <laughs> do that. Uh, I tend to grow flowers, and one of the earliest ones I start is lysianthus, which you actually want to start like in January. Oh, so wow. it's a very long. So some years I don't even, I don't even do it. I just purchase them <laughs> because okay. it's yeah. just such a long, uh, such a long time from January until I can plant them in May. It's a long time to keep them alive and thriving and growing so oh, sure. well yeah. and that's a good point that there's there's things you buy there's mm -hmm. things you start indoors mm -hmm. you know i i got originally got into seed starting because i couldn't find a tomato variety i really okay. liked at your yeah. average garden center um and so that's one of the advantages of, of starting vegetable seeds inside is you have a million different varieties you can choose from and uh, either in you know a lot of garden centers have a just giant seed display right yeah. now um, there's online sources for the really rare things and so I just found such a greater variety in seeds that that's that's kind of yeah. what got me into yeah. it absolutely well, I'm kind of in the same boat if it's something very unique or different mm -hmm. that I want to plant but there's plenty of times that 
that I just buy the starts. And I yeah. and I've started out with like great ambition, right? You know, this, <laughs> this like huge bunch of seeds. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I've started a bunch of stuff and all it takes is a couple of days of forgetting to water it. Yeah. And then all your bam. work is yeah. <laughs> all your work is lost. Which yeah, can, this, which yeah. can happen. We're all busy and running around. Uh-huh. And mm-hmm. That's the reality. And they're sensitive little plants when yeah. they start. They definitely need careful attention. Um, yeah. Okay, well, let's start maybe talking about kind of some basic equipment. So if somebody did want to start some seeds at home, they want to get a jump start on that season, what do they need? What are some of the kind of basics? I know oh, Jennifer she's... brought some of her stuff with her today. Well, so we start we want to start. Or at the let's bottom? start at the bottom. <laughs> Containers, what do we put in them, all of that? You want to start with that? Flat. Yeah, so we brought a couple different types of um, flats today. And you'll notice when you're, when you're looking at seed starting flats, you'll find a lot of different sizes. Okay, so even just looking at these two, you can see there, this one would have a much smaller size to it. This would be a little bit bigger, and then the ones that... And these are really uh, big. Yeah, that mm. would be really big. So that's kind of your first decision is, okay, what size container are you going to start with? So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Maybe if, if you're going to keep the seed in the same container the whole time until planting, or if your intention is to start it in a small container and then kind of bump it up, kind of what the mm-hmm. what the difference would be. Well, if you're, I can say a mistake yeah, I made. That. <laughs> yes, <laughs> please I do. I planted <laughs> tomatoes in smaller containers that needed to be bumped up before mm-hmm. they were outside and didn't anticipate the amount of space they were going to need. So mm-hmm. think about that as one thing to consider because mm-hmm. you are going to need to have enough light and enough um, space. Space to do it. Yeah, because so, yeah, when you first start it, you might have like, however oh, many are so in many. there. was the seven times, it's 100 and something plugs in here, however many. Um, yeah, so you're going to start your seed maybe in this container, get things started. But eventually, after a couple weeks, yeah. you'll find, right, that, that the roots are going to fill that container. They're going to start to dry out really quickly. Right. You're going to have to be watering a ton time. to keep things going. So then you get to a point, if it's not ready to go outside yet, and you still have a couple more weeks, then what do you do? You have to bump it up to a bigger right. container, right? So if you think of those 100 cells at this size, yeah. that's a lot more space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Suddenly it's multiplying mm-hmm. and taking over your house. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so you have to kind of keep So there's mind. a couple of different ways to deal with that. Um, you could just start your seeds in cells this big that really probably would, you know, see, it, see them through to you plant mm-hmm. them outside, uh, depending on the end size you want. I guess that's another question to answer mm-hmm. is, um, how big of a plant would you prefer to put out in the field? Where yeah. um, you know, so you could start things late enough that they would still be tiny and small, and you could put a little tiny mm-hmm. seedling out there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you know, it's not going to grow as well as something that's a little bigger that you've uh, you know nursed along a little bit longer, but you know, takes up less space and takes less time to get a small plant. Where for larger plants. It's going to take more time. You're probably going to have to pot up a few sizes. So yep. um, that's kind of a decision to make. How big? What, what's your goal on starting seeds? Sure. Um, one of them could be a super mature plant. I have a friend in southern Illinois that his goal is to have one of the first tomatoes every year. So I'm sure in his greenhouse <laughs> right now. He's got to have it, right? He's got tomato plants this <laughs> tall. Um, you know, but he has a lot of space in a greenhouse where um, we don't always have that space right. indoors. So yeah. So that's kind of the first decision is, you know, what what size plant you do want at the end, and then yeah. you can kind of, again, And how much backwards. space you have. I tend to mm-hmm. start mine a little bit later because, I, yeah, I just don't have the space to, right. and it, or the time a lot of times to bump it up into a larger container. So mm-hmm. for me, I'd rather start them a little bit later, keep them smaller, and then just kind of start with a smaller plant. But mm-hmm. you got to do what works for you. Cool. Well, we've got some great questions coming in so far, which is awesome. So we've got a question on YouTube here from Nicole. How often should I water my plants in a greenhouse? So she's growing these in a tray in a greenhouse. What do you, I mean, obviously a lot of factors come into play there. A lot of factors. I mean, you know, one way it seems really simple, but just to feel the soil, you know, is a great Mm -hmm. way to, to test it. But, um, and, and that's going to really tell you how, you know, when you feel it's really dry and it's only been six hours, uh, then you know it's every yeah. six hours. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to stay but, on top of it. I mean, I would definitely, I would guess in most greenhouse settings, it is definitely once a day. It's mm-hmm. multiple at times least, a right. day, yeah, probably. At least. Right. And you might want to yeah. consider bumping them up to a bigger pot size yeah. as they get bigger. Yeah. If you find they're mm-hmm. drying out in that like six hour period, then that's probably a good yeah. sign that you want, you need to bump up to a bigger pot that's going to have a little bit more soil. It's going to hold water a little bit longer. 
Uh, yeah, and you're right. A lot of it is touch and feel, especially in trays like this. After you work in a greenhouse for a while, you start to recognize even things by weight. Mm -hmm. You can kind of go oh, down, go good. go down sure. the thing, and just lift the tray a little bit and tell if it's really lightweight. Oh, that means it's pretty dry. It's time to time to water again. But yeah, just sticking your finger in there and really checking. Yeah, um, weight is really good because like this. This tray um, and potting soil really, I mean, doesn't even weigh all that much. Yeah, it's much. pretty so light when it's, it's dry. It's the water that really adds weight to yep. it, so you can really see that fluctuation. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So a good question, Nicole. Uh, we've also got a group joining us from Effingham High School. Welcome. Thanks right. for joining <laughs> us. They're the green team, and they're going to start vegetable seeds. They're going to start tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, etc. So they have a couple questions for us. So that's awesome. Um, so they said last year they grew their seeds in cups with holes in the bottom, okay. and they bottom watered. Do you find this to be the best, meth best method of watering, or is top watering better? So let's talk well, about that. Well, top first watering off, versus bottom. They, they have a really great point that you don't have to have these pre-bought, pre-made trays and yeah. things. Um, it's a great opportunity for recycling. The, the main thing that you need is just something that has drainage holes in the bottom. And they said that they... Yep, they had so, a hole in the bottom of the cup. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And, and some, even trays, too. So they talked about bottom watering. So when you purchase trays, bigger trays like this, and what they probably used was a tray underneath their cups, I imagine. Um, if you select a tray that doesn't have any holes in it, that gives you the option to actually fill this tray with water, put your, your plants back in it, and then let them absorb water from the bottom as opposed to the top. Mm -hmm. Do you guys, what do you think preference-wise? Have you done either? I've done either. What do you think? I've done both as well. I've done either. I really like the bottom watering method. Too. You're, um, you're I, less likely yeah. to break seedlings when you're watering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's always your danger when watering from the top is that you might, like, blast the seedlings out of the hole. You might cause damage to the stems. Or just wash soil off some of the roots. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. I found. Every oh, time yeah. I was pouring with a watering can, I was kind of washing some soil off some roots. So. Yeah. I like the fact that it's just non-erosive. It's it's from beneath, and you let the capillary action of the soil kind of pull it up. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah. and the key there is that you're not leaving it sitting in water all of the time, mm -hmm. right? So this tray doesn't have holes in it. So you do still have to kind of monitor. Come back after you've let the water kind of absorb into the tray. Come back later and make sure that there's not still a ton of water sitting in there, right? right? Yeah, because you don't want wet, soggy soil. No. You want you yeah. want moist soil. So that, I mean, there's you know where does that line fall between yeah. total saturation? <laughs> and, I mean, it's kind of a judgment call, but yeah. but you definitely don't want. You would not ever want to just keep water in that constantly, and your your soil is always super wet because yeah. that's that's going to cause some problems. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So yeah. So I think especially if you have if you guys have a greenhouse there at the high school. Um, I think bottom water is great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Top watering would be fine too. I tend to like the bottom bottom watering just because it's less messy. Mm -hmm. My setup's in the garage, so I don't really have a space where I can have a sprinkler and just kind of go crazy yeah. with okay. the with the sprinkler. But if you had a greenhouse where you could do that, that would work too. Yeah, but. you may have a way to you know put that water on onto this soil in a non erosive way yeah, with exactly. a, with a you know light mist or a, yeah, a sure. nicer shower where. In my indoor operation, I have a watering can. Me too. Yeah. So, so when you yes. pour, you yeah. know, yeah. it's messy. Well, it's hard so. to get it even. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So I think wa bottom watering is a great, great one to try. Great question. I brought a couple of um, homemade pots. If oh, you perfect. Like, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. oh, yeah. they mentioned they just used uh, cups with a hole in the bottom. So yeah. what are some other well, got, types of containers? Got a gadget that's kind of unnecessary, but <laughs> but, but it's, you could use a pop bottle or a can. Mm -hmm. It's a pot maker. So cool. You would wrap the strip of newspaper around it. You don't need tape or anything. Mm -hmm. And then tuck the, oh, wow. tuck the bottom in. Push it down. Push it down some. And then you would put your potting mix in there. And you nice. could put them, get one of the flats that yeah, like you were showing and, yeah. and fill it. And still you could bottom water and all of that. And then I guess technically you could plant the whole thing, but I usually rip the paper off because yeah. it doesn't never it doesn't ever break down as fast as they as you as think, you it, think will. it would. Yeah. And then this is toilet paper roll, or you could use a um, paper towel roll and cut it up, but I just put three slits and tuck the bottom in. Hold this is another one that you could get a some sort of non-draining container that you could still do bottom watering with. Nice. That. Well, I really like these options because it, it's kind of recycling. And yeah. It, you know, it decreases mm -hmm. your carbon footprint a bit of your <laughs> yeah. operation as opposed to all this plastic. Right. Yeah. You know, we've got a recycled material and... 
Um, yeah, that's really neat. I've never seen that with the oh. newspaper pots. That's a great one. That's really cool. Yeah, I've done that before just with a like a soup can. S yeah. Same, same mm -hmm. thing, but that's nice that it kind of kind of decreases a little more the entry fee into yeah. starting yeah. seeds because it Absolutely. can start to add up. And I think I would I would agree with you that I would probably tear that newspaper away because mm -hmm. just in my mind I never want anything stopping a root from getting out into more soil. Right. So, right. Yeah. And you, you never know. want it like even those peat pots like if yeah. you can plant those too but you never want to leave any of it above the soil or it's a wick yeah because it'll pull yeah. moisture out so a lot of times i'll just like rip the top edge off right. of stuff like that so it's not pulling your moisture out cool okay awesome so they've got another question here when do you start fertilizing seedlings true well, when true when leaves think? when they've got true leaves because okay. the first couple leaves that come out are the seed leaves mm -hmm, or the cotyledons. Mm -hmm. I usually wait till I've got see at least a couple true leaves and then hold off. Kind of, I would do like a quarter or half strength as mm -hmm. to what the label says because mm -hmm. you be careful what you wish for with <laughs> fertilizing because you you it's easy to go overboard. It's easy to go overboard yeah. and it doesn't have these giant plants that again you don't. You're like, oh no, I don't have like right. a whole entire back room to fill with these plants. You, you don't want to have them growing so fast that they're just so big before you put them out necessarily unless you're in a a uh, competitive tomato <laughs> situation yeah. in southern Illinois. Absolutely. Uh, well, yeah, and so then it's it's about once a week at half strength. Yeah. Is, that's kind of how I've done it. It's yeah. about once a week at half strength. Now, I, mean, I guess another thing that comes into play is whether or not your uh, soil mix at the start had fertilizer in it. Right. Yep. So there's yep. times that you can buy st things that have three or four months worth of fertil fertil mm -hmm. fertilizer added, and that may reduce or eliminate right. your need to even add any fertilizer. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and that was actually the next question. Do you recommend... Uh, uh, a soil so we can talk maybe next about some different types of soil you can use and she also said they seem to get a lot of mold or some other fungus on the top of their soil oh, so sounds like too can, much water there. yeah and that mm -hmm. yeah that does sound like maybe that especially if you're bottom watering uh, it might be that you're leaving too much of that water in the tray too mm -hmm. long and that your your soil is staying a little too moist uh, that's causing some of that to grow um, but yeah, let's talk about different kind of soil mm -hmm. seed starting mm -hmm. soil Can mixes and one? yeah, and what you would what would you recommend? So I guess the first thing though is we're not going to use garden soil. Right. Yes, yeah. absolutely. We're not going to go outside, work. dig up some soil, I brought bring it in. Oh, too. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. A little bit of that. I'm trying awesome. to look at what does this one say? It's got for fertilizer. So this is actually a seed starting right. potting mix, which is a little different than regular potting mix. It typically has a little finer materials in there. Mm -hmm. um, it, in regular, just regular old potting mix, uh, also referred to as soilless media. Yep. Soilless you know, that's kind of a confusing media. term. Yeah, so yep. It looks a whole lot like regular um, old potting mix. Yeah they, yeah, they look a lot the same, but I found in regular potting mix, there's sometimes bigger chunks. Yeah, yeah it's a finer, yeah, yeah. finer particle. Definitely drains faster. Yeah. Drains mm -hmm. faster. And, well, and I found, like, the problem with those bigger chunks, then, is when you go to plant one little tiny <laughs> right. seed right in the middle of this, <laughs> and there's covering. a chunk next yeah. to there. Um, right. It's either covering it or it creates a weird air pocket there right by mm -hmm. your seed sometimes. So... I, I like the actual seed starting mix. I do too. Um, mm -hmm. Although regular potting soil. Yeah, if work. all you had was regular potting mix, you could certainly use that too. Just be a cognizant of kind of breaking up the big chunks. Yeah, or you're you, just, them in the... or you just remove the big chunks from yeah. that middle spot yeah. where you're going to plant at. Yep. You know, so. Yeah, yeah, I was kind of a slow convert to the seedling mix, but once I started using it, I got a lot better results. Nice. Mm -hmm. And if you're still having trouble with moisture and such, vermiculite might be a. Yeah. A good yeah. answer to mix it in with the seedling mix or even use it. Do you put it on the top? You can afterwards. use it on the top, mm -hmm. like if you're doing mm -hmm. a really fine seed. Mm -hmm. and that's just a that's a mineral. And that, this one is a really fine grade. Yeah. Okay. Well, and yeah. you and you guys at the at the high school there, if you're doing a large quantity of seed starting, you might even think about mixing up your own oh, kind yeah. of mix too, because buying it in small bags like that obviously is going to be not be the most cost right. effective. So, yeah, coming up with your own combination of peat moss and vermiculite and perlite might be mm -hmm. a, uh, a more cost-effective way if you're doing a lot of, oh, of sure. seed starting, Another too. Another opportunity to learn, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and there's pretty good, pretty easily accessible mixture rates for those yeah. online that I've, at, at a number of different places, different um, UVI extension or other mm -hmm. um, extension services have some pretty good info out there. So. Yeah, Absolutely. Cool. Well, awesome questions so far, guys. Keep those questions coming in the chat box, and we're going to answer them as we go um, through today. Um, so while we wait for some questions, 
what else? You want to talk about maybe temperature next? So once you've got the soil in, mm -hmm. you've, you've got your seeds planted, now what? What do you <laughs> well, What do you do so after there, that? There's some concerns with temperature. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, first off, just for seed germination, um, you know, especially if you're if you're doing it indoors, just doing mm -hmm. it yourself at your house. Uh, there's times that that spot in your house can be a little cold mm -hmm. for seed seed starting. So, um, Jennifer, you brought a little heat mat. Yeah. So that's one way to overcome this. Yeah, I was kind of a slow convert to this as well because. Um, this one at the time I bought it was about $30 and I've got some at home that this fits one flat really mm -hmm. nicely and I've got a couple at home that fit two and it fits in my little seed starting area. These will raise the temperature of the soil in your flats um, anywhere from 10 to 20 degrees higher than your surrounding air. Okay. So it's a relative thing. It's not necessarily an absolute thing. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a room, um, like I like to start stuff in an unused bedroom and you're not sure on the temperature or a basement is a popular place because mm -hmm. you want to put it out of the yeah. out of the way it is possible to get a thermostat that will so you don't want to have this necessarily want to have this on 24 7 if you're afraid it's going to overheat things okay. um this is a thermostat where you can i have it set up so i can plug several mats into it this end would go into the soil and then you set it at whatever you want your temperature to be. So like uh, you you had brought some stuff, Ryan, about what temperatures. Mm -hmm. Peppers need a little bit higher mm -hmm. temperature of soil than some of the other crops. So Yeah, so to really put it into numbers, um, you know, peppers need, you know, 75 to 85 degrees soil mm -hmm. temperature. And I think they're notorious for not germinating right. unless you yeah. give them a little heat or your house is just that warm where... Other things, I mean, I guess the widest range I saw kind of in a table of that was cucumbers could get anywhere from 70 to 95. Wow. <laughs> you know, so yeah. um, different crops have different sensitivity to that. And actually where I was looking at that information is um, in this uh, manual that's put out by Extension Vegetable Gardening in the Midwest. It's a great book. Yeah. And so this has been updated over the years. I think this was 2018 or 2017 mm -hmm. was the most recent update. But um you know, we have an on, a place you can purchase this online. I, I We sell it in my office mm -hmm. here in Champaign. I don't know if, if your local extension yeah, office quite does. Quite a few it's of them do. Maybe worth calling and asking if you really want to go pick up a copy today. But yeah. um, it is a nice little chapter on seed starting where it talks mm -hmm. about, I believe there's a, a recipe for mixing your own uh, okay. soil medium. Um, okay. It talks about these different temperature ranges. But uh, the thing to understand is that, you know, I, I've tried um, just – in my basement to start mm -hmm. seeds and that does not work no it's too cold um it's mm -hmm. too cold down there and i mean I, i've had mm -hmm. to move my whole setup to another place mm -hmm. so um this can at least give you some ballpark ideas um it also has i i believe air temperature on that same table mm -hmm. which is a little bit less um mm -hmm. and actually you know one of the recommendations is after you kind of get that first seed up and get things going to not have a super hot air temperature right. on the plants because that, you know, a colder air temperature around the plants is going to make them a little shorter mm -hmm. and a little stouter. Which is what as, we want. Yeah. 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 Nice Much stronger short, stocky. Yeah. In the mm -hmm. garden. As opposed to a long spindly thing. That's the last thing you want. Yeah. So. Right. Great. Yeah. And we've got a link posted to that uh, book on the chat box there and on but, Facebook there. So Yeah. Just a great resource for Illinois specific gardening. I mean, it's, yeah. it's called vegetable gardening in the Midwest, but it divides it up by our three different zones in the mm -hmm. state that you'd really look at. And um, it has a section on each and every vegetable, how to harvest them, how to plant them, how to take care of them. Um, I think this most recent update mostly added a ton of varieties. So they have a, a listing yeah. of a bunch of new varieties in the sure. back. So that can help you select the exact right variety for what you want. And, you know, if you're really picky and snobby about your <laughs> seeds, then you can find that just perfect variety out here awesome. that, that will work in Illinois. So that's the nice thing about it. Cool. Okay, well, we've gotten some questions come in while we've been chatting here. So question from Carolina here on Facebook. Can you recommend a good seed starting self-made mix that doesn't include vermiculite and perlite as those might be problematic in your veggie garden? First off, what do you think? Would it be problematic to add too much vermiculite or perlite to your veggie garden? Mm. That's actually a major part of one of the recipes for uh, square foot gardening. Mm -hmm. is one part vermiculite, one is part. Is to make your... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have never... It, and to me, you're, you're, it's going to be such a small amount right. of perlite and vermiculite in a like a plug that you're planting out there. 
Uh, and they're still natural materials, right. so they're still going to break down over yeah, time. Yeah, it's, it's not like a plastic or you right. know something artificial mm-hmm. you're adding. Mm-hmm. I guess what they do is increase drainage, yeah. and that's one of the points of these mm-hmm. coarser materials. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess I've really learned the lesson with thinking you could add sand to soil oh. and increase drainage very <laughs> yeah, much. Right. I mean, the millions <laughs> yeah. of parts of sand to every part of soil right. you have to add, it's yeah. just really hard to ever get much of a change in soil drainage. So if your, your worry is, you know, a, changing soil texture so it drains too fast, I, I don't think it's going to do that with the minute amount that you add out of this. And um, I mean, to be totally honest, I don't know of a mixture that I've read that doesn't include that. I don't either. Because um, the other components typically just peat moss, and you wouldn't want to use straight peat moss. Um, too much moisture. That would be, yeah, it would hold too much moisture. And if it dries out, it's just going to be a brick. cinch up too. So, so it's yeah. probably going to need some type of coarse particle to help with drainage, whether mm-hmm. that's sand, sand or perlite or, mm-hmm. or whatever you might use. Yeah, um, and I suppose, could you make some compost in it? Yeah. If, like if it was really yeah. good, yeah. finely, yeah. Good finely um, sifted compost? You know, one, one thing to look at is maybe some of the recommended mixtures for organic production because they'll, mm-hmm. they'll be using some different materials. Mm-hmm. I don't true. know where um, in the world of organic, you know, some of these coarse materials fall. Yeah, I don't either. They, but they may have some alternatives there, or um, that's just something to mention too. With you know, stuff that has fertilizer added, that's obviously not an organic system. That you know, when you have pre-added fertilizer. Yeah. So in the past, I've made my own, and I've added what I an organic fertilizer sure, to it, sure. as opposed to buying the pre-made mm-hmm. stuff. Sure, um, sure. So yeah. there's there's all kinds of different different mixtures out there. Um, I I hate to say I don't have any. Uh, direct experience with one that doesn't include no, those. I don't yeah, know yeah. So and so. maybe Carolina, do some some Google searches, but include extension in your searches and see if you can come up with some other sources from other states. They might have some recipes out there. But yeah, yeah. We always try and direct folks to you know scientific you know yeah, research yeah. based yeah. information. Make sure so, it comes from a good. So you know source. if you go out and find just you know Ryan's garden blog somewhere <laughs> that that might not be scientific based in somebody's opinion. Not to say some of those things wouldn't work, but um, just as a, you know, as an extension educator, we always try to direct folks to something uh, based on research. So yeah. other extension websites, other yeah. .edu mm-hmm. websites are kind of our recommended places to search yeah, for that info. Those are always good. Okay, back to our uh, folks in Effingham here. She, they said they have a room that they've converted into their grow room. They grow under grow lights. Um, they've brought some plants in from the outdoors last summer, and currently they have some insects in those oh. rooms. Oh. So any way, is there a way for us to treat the insects before they harm our seedlings? Pest control. Well, I think the first ze- step would be identification mm-hmm. of the pest. Yep, figuring you know, out what so exactly. figure out what it is. Mm-hmm. May or may not be something that even wants to bother your seedlings. So, true, true. Um, I'm trying to think of... Uh, Help me out. Is it fungus gnats that are yep, the fungus. really common one? Okay. Yeah. So if you have um, if you have little kind of almost look like fruit flies flying around, that could be fungus gnats. And typically that's a fairly easy solution mm-hmm. by just letting the soil dry down. Mm-hmm. That'll that'll kill off those. Um, because aphids it's because maybe. it's moisture. It's it's yeah. keeping yeah. the soil yep. overly moist that allows them to reproduce and everything. So yep. you just so have to them. really like perfectly water let it totally right. dry right. out yeah. and then let it water dry it. out before water let it totally ri- dry uh, out again yeah. so. um some Me- of the other things could bugs, be yeah spider mealy mi- bugs spider, mite. spider mites aphids those would all be common kind scale. of indoor yeah scale so i would try to first identify what you what you have um and then you can figure out how to control those whether that means you need to bring in a chemical control or it might simply mean which is never fun it might just simply mean to get rid of the other plants mm-hmm. That the that the insects are on. Um, Separate them one way or another. Yeah, or move I mean, them to another space. Really sanitize that grow room mm-hmm. before you bring those seedlings back in there. Um, but if you can get us a picture of the that yeah. pest, uh, Kelly's not here today, but mm-hmm. she's our <laughs> insect expert, and we'll get it to Kelly to to get an identification. Oh, so. good. They said fungus gnats, fungus gnats, and thrips. So. Fungus gnats, that'll be fairly simple, like we talked about. Mm-hmm. So let make sure you're letting those containers, that soil, dry out pretty good before you water again, and that'll take care of those pretty simply. Thrips are a little trickier. Thrips tend to hide inside flowers and mm-hmm. inside crevices in the plant. So that's going to be a little bit um, trickier. You might have to do some, some, chemi- some chemical controls on that, or, like we said, simply taking those plants to another location. Because mm-hmm. thrips are typically not going to infect seedlings. They're, they tend to be more of a flowering plant mm-hmm. 
pests, so that probably wouldn't be too bad. Yeah. But good. At least you know what they are. That's the first yeah, start. Yeah, that's great. That's, <laughs> that's great. the first start. And you can always email us to some more information and like we said, Kelly's our she's our insect lady, so we can get her on the mm-hmm. <laughs> we can get her on the job for sure. Okay, awesome questions. Um, a question from Kimberly. Do you have recommendations on where to get seeds? Where do you shop for seeds? Oh boy, well, there's so places. many places. places. <laughs> so um, many places. I mentioned garden centers. You know, your local garden center usually brings in a whole selection of mm-hmm. seeds this time of year. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a place to walk in and buy it. But um, boy, if you hit the internet, there's oh, just oh, a man. million. There's a rabbit hole. <laughs> you know, it's come up in a couple months. Um, Endless. For me, I tend to all of my gardening practices are organic. And so I tend to try and seek out organic seeds with the thought that, you know, something that is can be grown and produces sure. a seed organically, I should be able to produce in my garden organically. So that okay. kind of narrows my search um, to certain websites okay. that, that host a lot of or- organic things. Sure, but. sure. Okay. Yeah. I'm not a total organic gardener. I'm kind of middle of the road. I, if there's a problem that I can't solve, mm-hmm. I do occasionally spray. Um, I look at different different companies online i try to not just buy like one thing from one person one thing from another because it the shipping costs get to be expensive so starting to pay attention to that Mm -hmm. um depending on what you're on what you're growing on the size of the seed packet some of them are quite expensive for not a lot of seed um but i i try to do my a lot of things online for um different varieties that I can't yeah. find in the store. You know, I tend I, to, too, just because you have the best selection. Right. On, uh, you can get it all I have one. been surprised, though, at what the local garden center has yeah. these days. And, I mean, I can really more. I can really even find organic varieties mm-hmm. that I, I want to purchase at, at garden centers, where it used to be maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. That just wasn't – you would never find organic seed in it. Yeah. In, in, in your true. average garden center. That's so. Um, so that's that's yeah. always where I usually kind of look first. That's kind of There's just some place I, I can walk too. into and grab them. And then if I can't find them there, then I go yeah. to the Internet. And that's what yeah. I start with, too. Yeah. And if, there, if there's something I need in quantity, sometimes you can find better deals online than buying, you know, 20 packets of something. Yeah, mm-hmm. bigger, mm-hmm. bigger quantities. Awesome. Okay, so a question from Mike here. He said, inspired by the Four Seasons webinar, he started a cold frame for his onions and his radishes. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Four Seasons webinars, you can find those on mm. YouTube as well. Great uh, webinars to watch. Um, how tall should I let the seedlings go before planting in the garden? So he's got onions and radishes in particular. But how how big in general do you kind of want a transplant to be? Uh, well, a couple factors there mm-hmm. would be um, just its ability with to withstand natural mm-hmm. conditions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So hopefully you've kind of opened up your, you'll have had a point in time where you've right. opened up your cold frame some, you've exposed it to, carefully exposed it to the, mm-hmm. you know, environment right. a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's probably going to be a timing thing, right? It yeah, would be would think. once, once the temperatures warm up enough, since you've already set things in motion, you know, yeah. you're going to have a certain size plan on that. On, a, on you know, the date that you yeah. accept as our frost free date, right, right. playing the odds. You probably need at least um, a couple of weeks of exposing those plants to the natural, outdoor temperature. Yeah, more outdoor conditions. So, for that process, we should maybe talk about that a little bit. Um, that you just want to get um, dur- during the day. T- so, we'll hit a point this spring where during the daytime mm-hmm. your plants are fine, but at night it gets too cold. Right. And that's where a cold frame is awesome because mm-hmm. you can. Open it up during the daytime, expose them mm-hmm. to some wind, some extra sunlight, and then close it at night and protect them. Yeah. Um, if you don't have a cold frame, you can take your trays outside and bring them <laughs> yeah. back in. Yeah, that's, that's what I do. That's usually what I end up doing. <laughs> uh, but you just have to be careful, and you have to slowly, I mean, maybe start right. with a couple hours on a really nice day. and In the know, shade. It, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In the shade, not that's right a in really the, good not point. Super bright sun. Not right in the wind. Yep. So all those things about the environment that are right. different from indoors, those plants have to get ready for, and that's wind is one, and mm-hmm. direct sun is mm-hmm. so different than mm-hmm. anything we can provide. And it doesn't take long to so, fry your seedlings if you were yeah. to just mm-hmm. And then again, all that work. Yes. Just, oh, that's the worst. <laughs> yeah. That's I think we've all killed some seedlings. <laughs> yes, yes. We, it's like the mark of a sure um, yeah. But, you know, we as sure we have. started to talk about sunlight, <clears throat> that brings up an important point that um, – you're going to need some light oh, indoors. Yeah, yeah let's um, look at some. So you brought a couple I examples. I a couple of examples. lighting options. Well, I brought, this is an example of the light that I would use on seedlings, and it pings. 
I had some chains. Kind of hangs up like. Kind of hangs up. Okay. Or, oh, it's got a, or there's like a cable thing. Cool. Um, but it's got all, all the light you need. For, basically, it's supposed to be for about four square feet, but I, I think that's a little generous estimate. <laughs> so what I did was I would put another one here. And sure. you want to have it as close as you possibly can. And so this the, is LED? This is LED, yes. And they have come down in price um, considerably. I remember years yeah. ago listening to a speaker talking about changing over all her stuff to LED and kind of looking up the price while she was talking. And it was <laughs> like $150 really for something like wow, this. And I was yeah. like, oh, no, never. Yeah, not <laughs> worth it. Not, yeah. I'll no, buy not trans, in, not in the budget, <laughs> right? But I bought this a couple of years ago. It was about $25. So they've come yeah, down in bad. price considerably. And so um, that's what I would use for seedlings. It's not super glamorous looking. But from a standpoint of sustainability, energy use, and things, right. LED are, are going to be your best bet because they're going to use the lowest amount of Yeah, they're definitely Absolutely. the most efficient. Yeah. This is another another option. This one is kind of a little more. I use this one just for house plants, but you could use it for seedlings too. It has a clip. You could clip it on a shelf, and there's kind of three goosenecks. So you could okay. put. It's not as intense as that one is, but it works for house plants. And if you had like just a couple of seedling starts, it has a timer built in, which is nice. This one, the silver one I was showing does not have a timer so I would use like a household timer. Yeah, like a Christmas Probably about light 16 timer. hours on and 8 hours off in a day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is what I would do. And what do you do at your house? Yeah, I have I a do timer. The same. Yeah. I have a timer about for 16 all my and stuff. 8, yeah. And yeah, I, timers and are cheap. Yeah. You know, just bite the bullet and buy one if you're going to yeah. do this. Yeah. yeah. Well, and now I have one too that's on my Alexa so I can say Alexa, turn on the Oh, wow. <laughs> turn on the ceiling lights. That's, that's like really fancy. Up a <laughs> but otherwise, my setup is very low tech. I actually I tend to just use fluorescent bulbs. Just mm -hmm. because I haven't made the jump to switch to LEDs, so I just get the cool white fluorescent long, long tubes from from the home store, and like you said, I keep them as close kind of as possible to the to the plants, and that does it. Yeah, yeah that that's, does it for me. Honestly, but. that's what I use too is mm -hmm. uh, the cool yeah. white fluorescents, and I like you. I saw how the expensive LED lights years ago, and have okay. just <laughs> I just have never changed because yeah. I have Someday a setup that I works. Will. But um, I use just. Uh, scrap lumber around my house mm -hmm. to make these. I, I didn't bring a picture because they look really shabby, but <laughs> little frames that hold the, the lights jump. and have an adjust, a way to adjust. Like you have those chains. I just yeah. have little chains on those, um, you know, fluorescent tube light ballast mm -hmm. and move those up, move those up as the plants grow. But, um, you know, usually trying to keep them about two to four inches off the top of the plants sure. as they grow yeah, keep a reason. and that's what's nice about um, chains like that because then you can just keep like moving yeah. Them. so yeah to, ma to have to make your own that's really good like one of the best one of the best things to have is a nice way that it fits your size trays so i made mm -hmm. it to fit the exact size tray i use in the bottom just had a little wood rail that kind of holds them yeah. uh and then have a you know a rack up above that holds the light that can raise it up and down and, and whatever light you choose right. to use it uh works with those yeah. and um, you can buy them pre-made at mm -hmm. garden centers on the internet. Uh, they they make a lot of really nice pre-made ones yeah. as well. You're gonna probably pay a little more. So yeah. Yeah, that I, was my cheap way of doing yeah. it. it I had a baker's here. rack for years, and oh, I bought yeah. it in the kitchen yeah. section. Yeah, I just have like a shelving kind of. And unit, it was yeah. exactly the width. Of, I used the fluorescent bulbs for years, yeah. and then I mm -hmm. I changed to the LEDs, and when I bought a little. It's these little portable greenhouses. They're they're about twenty dollars, and about ev every grocery store, dollar yeah, store, yeah. big box store has them this yeah. time of year. But it fits it fits two flats, and it fits the lights nice. really well. Nice, that works then. Yeah, they had a question here: Is there a preferred color wavelength of light? So, for green growth, we need, need blue, blue. wavelength, mm -hmm. right? So that's why I'm good with just the fluorescence, because all I ever grow are just seedlings, young yeah. young green plants. Um, some of the LEDs or specific grow lights are going to have mm -hmm. some red wavelength yeah. in them, mm -hmm. which is adjustable. what, does that one have? Yeah, yeah it's adjustable. Too. And that's what plants would need for flowering. Right. So if you're just growing seedlings, green plants, then blue wavelength is good. But if, you, if you're growing them a little longer than that, past mm -hmm. that, then you might need some red in there. And not, not that, you know, the, the plant bulbs are all that <laughs> yeah, fancy right. compared to the regular ones, but you can always buy one that's labeled for plant growth. And in that case, on the package, it usually kind of says it's combination of red and blue red, light, yeah. so you can kind of figure that out. But yeah. And they usually call um, it a grow, a grow light. You know, it's it's a good point on the cool white bulbs yeah. because you when you have them so close to the, to the plants, you don't want them generating a lot of heat yeah. where they can dry things out. So that's... Yeah. 
maybe a consideration, you know, a bulb that's not going to generate heat. So your your good old fashioned incandescent yep. light bulb, yeah, that's yeah. that's yeah. going to be a heat generating thing. Yep. That's going to be yeah. the and least energy will, efficient. And that's, I believe, if I remember, it's yeah. usually red, more red wavelength mm. too, which mm -hmm. for seed mm -hmm. starting to, wouldn't give you a whole, whole lot of good. Yeah. Um, okay. Question here from our Epican group. What do you feel is the best or easiest plant to start from seed for a beginner home gardener? So what would you recommend? Best, easy. I got a couple flower well, suggestions, but what about, um, what do you think? I mean, I started on tomatoes and peppers, yeah. but I, I can't say that, I can't gardeners. say they're the easiest, though. <laughs> yeah, um, I wouldn't say they're the easiest. Yeah. I, may, I would maybe go with um, squash, because just because there's a shorter window that you have to take care of them mm -hmm. inside, so especially mm -hmm. the squash Pretty or quick. even And it's a bigger seed. Yeah, it's easier to handle. Mm -hmm. Some people say cucumbers are tough to transplant. I've never had a problem with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, neither have I. Mm -hmm. but and in both squash and cucumbers, it's what is it like four or four five weeks? weeks. Yeah, you know, so yeah, a lot. so you don't have like with tomatoes and peppers, you know, eight Months. weeks yeah. uh, of indoor growth. So that, that's maybe the advantage to those. Um, I've always had them uh, germinate really well, mm -hmm. squash and yeah, cucumbers. And, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. those are maybe some good starters. Good um, I've had pretty good luck with uh, lettuce. Oh, I mean, yeah. that's mm -hmm. that's a fairly easy one to start. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, these these trays are really nice for starting lettuce that are, have oh. no divisions mm -hmm. or you can get a whole tray that's just a flat yeah. that mm -hmm. has no division so that's kind of how I've done lettuce in the past where um, the the main method I've used is just a whole flat and you know you can sprinkle those okay. those lettuce seeds just mm -hmm. kind of everywhere and then add a little tiny tiny bit of soil to the top just to cover mm -hmm. those or that vermiculite and yeah. um, as those little seedlings come up this is the hardest part but I've picked out and oh, thinned wow. out till I had <laughs> and the reason why you don't want you know this sure. is if this is if you're going to start them really early and you're going to transfer and you, them and out you're wanting to grow individual heads I'm wanting to get yeah. down to individual okay. plants yeah. in so here so they're too crowded so so that's one way to do it is thin it out i mean another way is to just start them start them in the tray and not yeah. ever thin them mm -hmm. um, well, and i've just started them outside and not thin them to, intending yeah. to go in with scissors and yeah. cut it yeah mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. i always have a hard time kind of thinning though because you <laughs> this thing has grown i yeah hate, right. yeah, I hate pulling yeah it out, sacrificing but, a, um yeah. but yeah that's that's a pretty easy one and i, I kind of liked it when i first started because it's something you're messing with you know oh, it, sure. you're always looking at oh that little plant's not doing as good as that one i'm going to pick one out kind of scratches the garden itch yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it's a fun thing to do yeah. this time of year so well and Radish is another one that germinates super quick for mm -hmm. people too. I wouldn't necessarily start radish seed like in a container because it's a root vegetable. Right. But like if you've never started a seed before, when usually when I do kids activities, it's I really do radish cool. a lot because yeah. it's super fast. You get like almost instant gratification of that seed germinating. Mm -hmm. So it's always super fun. Yeah, yeah. And then in terms of flowers, if you if you'd rather start flower seeds with some of your vegetables, zinnia is one that I would certainly recommend. It, Bigger seed germinates really quickly. Marigolds, mm -hmm. same thing. Uh, maybe Cosmos. Mm -hmm. um, those those would be a couple that I would kind of start with. Yeah. You know, and also some that you can start outside too. Like yeah, those, exactly. You don't have to start them inside either. Outside, but yeah. Um, yeah, those are great ones to start indoors though. Yeah, sunflowers too. That would be. Those are good too. Mm -hmm. Big seeds. Yeah. Good question. Um, okay, couple. One more question here um, from. Uh, YouTube here. When I start sunflower seeds for my garden, how do I make it so I have weeks and weeks of blooms instead of all of them coming to a head and then dying at the same time? <laughs> so, this is called succession planting. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So if you're talking about sunflower in particular, what you would do is you would want to actually space out your planting time. So you might do your first planting of sunflower seeds at that frost-free date, whatever it might be, early May, let's say. And then you might wait two weeks and do another planting and wait two more weeks and do another plant and can continue planting until probably, oh, probably July. You'd probably stop because then you wouldn't have enough time after that. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, that's called succession planting where you're, you're spacing out your plantings with the idea that you're going to have a harvest at different at different sure. intervals. So like this time of year, you would be starting, a, you could start some indoors yeah. to get yep. the very first so, ones out. So you out. could have transplants ready to go outside right when that kind of frost-free date is passed. And then after that, you could start direct seeding them mm -hmm. outside in, in different locations. And that's what I, how I usually do that is with lettuce. Okay. You know, yeah, so what are some other, what are some vegetables you might do um, that with? Any of those leafy greens. Well, I do it with yeah. green beans. 
Oh yeah, I, got, oh, I yeah. don't ever start green beans as a start. I've seen them sold that way, and I kind of scratch my start. head at that. <laughs> but um, I will start green beans out in the garden, and then at two week intervals, just Do so another. you kind of are having a steady state of green beans rather than mm-hmm. all of it, all at, of once. it at once. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's just a way to spread out your harvest mm-hmm. is yeah. essentially what it does. Or in the case of sunflowers, to have beautiful sunflowers all, yeah. all and summer. It's, and it's specifically for those things where you tend to, like, harvest once. Like a, like a tomato plant, you're not really going to succession yeah. plant because you're you're going to be harvesting right. from it all season long. But something like a, a radish, you're going to mm-hmm. harvest it once and then it's done. So if you spaced yeah. out every couple weeks, you had new radish that was then ready to... I've done that a lot with beets. Yeah, oh, okay. with beets, yeah. 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 And, and basically you just, you know, it's, I, with beets, I would just seed one row this week. The next week I'd seed the next row, okay. then you know, in, in mm-hmm. week intervals. And, you know, you just, then you're going back and you have to be ready to harvest with each <laughs> yeah, row in right. a week, you know, yeah. week yeah, apart. You, gotta, but, you almost need a, a um, calendar that you can write on so you can really kind of plan. To plan, plan it, coming. but, you know, once, once but things are coming always, up, yeah. you, can, <laughs> you can tell which ones are ready and which ones aren't. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great question. So back, you were talking about thinning your uh, lettuce with scissors. John asked, can you use those thin seedlings as microgreens? So if you are doing yeah. some of that thinning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can certainly eat them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of people actually grow seeds for that purpose. Mm-hmm. They'll harvest them when they're at a very young stage and use them as a microgreen instead of letting them let them grow yeah that's a great way to grow indoors too is the microgreens concept because you don't have plants that you're nursing along and getting huge and you know these little trays i showed you in here um without the divisions are great for microgreens Mm -hmm. indoors yeah great question okay i think we've caught up on our questions for now so if you have we got about 15 minutes left so if you have questions about seed starting or anything else add them into the chat box there um, we did have a question come in ahead of time on a, a different subject that we can address today, too. Uh, a question from Carolina. She asks, um, I need to rotate my solanum out of my garden bed because of either fusarium or verticillium wilt. Could be both. Um, but do these affect uh, Fasalis? I grow ground cherries, and I wasn't sure if I need to keep those out as well. So, so anything in that solanaceous family she's having some diseases with. And she needs so so you'd want to talk a little bit about kind of crop rotation a little bit yeah one solution to that could be crop rotation yeah. and mm-hmm. um you know the, this vegetable gardening in midwest in the midwest book has a nice little figure of how you do crop rotation and basically um, there's just different groups of garden vegetables that probably about four or five of them mm-hmm. that you would rotate through each year so that's one way to overcome something uh that's maybe in the so the that is Soil infecting warm. your yeah. plants year yeah. after year. Now, verticillium wilt is one that we, there's a whole list of plants that are susceptible to it. Mm-hmm. And uh, crop rotation is not gonna get right. rid of it. Uh, so if that is in fact, uh, definitely what you have, you're gonna have to just reference a list. I don't know it off the top of my head yeah, of everything that does and doesn't get it's verticillium wilt, but there's been a lot of research into that particular pathogen and there, there's great lists out there. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, with crop rotation, um, it's just planning that you know each year you plant a different section uh, you know different selection of uh those plants Mm -hmm. in the different groups in your garden and um it you know it the problem that i've had with it is that i didn't write down what was there last (laughs) right you you think you would remember but make a map of the years start to get kind of together together. and and so i found it just really useful and i i mean it's kind of fun to do to just draw a little sketch in my garden Mm -hmm. as i lay it out each year um, it's even helped me kind of figure out where to put things, sure. but it, I, and I've, I've went to where I have just about a, an eight bed raised bed, se- you know, mm-hmm. section of my, of my garden. And by raised bed, I mean a little bit higher than the yeah. path, you know, I haven't done a lot of raising. Uh, so I just know if I, if one bed was, you know, tomatoes and peppers last year, the next year it's going to be root crops, sure. you know, yeah. I'm going to follow it with just a whole different group of, of vegetables. And that alone can do a lot for many of these mm-hmm. common mm-hmm. diseases and problems. Well, and I've I've fallen into the um, trouble of not having enough space to rotate as efficiently as I want. So, looking at varieties that have some resistance bred into them for oh. yeah is can be helpful, especially in tomatoes and Definitely. all the Solanaceous crops. Yeah, yeah. So when you're flipping through those seed catalogs or looking those online, those little letters mean something. Look for those resistance <laughs> as much as possible. Yeah, and, and honestly, that's one of the things that led me to starting my own seeds and wanting mm-hmm. a 
greater variety of seeds because in your just run of the mill big box store garden center, you really don't have many of those. A lot of those no. de- really yeah, disease know. resistant yeah. things. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because it takes some development to get plant spread right. that develop those character characteristics mm-hmm. that cost money that makes it so. You know, to purchase those as a garden center, you're going to have to spend a little bit more money. You're going to have to sell them for a little mm-hmm. bit more, and the average consumer wants the cheapest tomato plant. Right. Yeah. So, exactly. um, so it's just the way the market works and things. But um, just it, it's always good to kind of do that research, especially if you. I focus on organic. Mm-hmm. You know, where I really want as much disease resistance out of plant breeding yeah, sure. as I can possibly yeah. get. So absolutely. Cool. Excellent question. We got a question come in here. Kelly's watching now, and she says, hey, you took her spot. So uh, <laughs> I'm claiming this seat She's jealous. You're sitting in her spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we do have a question here from Kimberly again. She said she's planning to start celery this year, and she's never grown it before. Any tips for growing celery? And then also, how about blueberries? Anybody grown uh, celery? celery? I've yeah. never <laughs> grown celery. Yeah. <laughs> I um, haven't either, because I've always read in this, I think, this that book, is, yeah. and it's like, it doesn't grow great in Illinois. So yeah. I, I can tell you a substitute, though, if if you try the celery and it doesn't work out. Mm-hmm. I've grown the herb, is it Lovage or Lo... Lo- uh, yeah, Lovage. L-O-V-A. Uh-huh. I I've never know. Heard of I don't know how to say it. Yeah, yeah. I've never said it out I've heard, yeah, I've heard of this. <laughs> But it has the celery flavor. You just use the leaves from okay, it. Okay, okay. Um, so Interesting. kind of an alternative if the celery seeds don't work out. Because I've also read I've always read that, that book, too. And yeah, but then again, work. I've seen at the farmer. There's an organic farmer in, in Bloomington that sh- they bring celery to the farmers market. Mm-hmm. So it it's it can possible. be done. Yeah. But I I've just never. <laughs> I've uh, never maybe, it. I don't know. This might be a new <laughs> new fun experiment for this maybe year. One to, to try. try. Some yeah. Celery, but. Yeah. What was the other part of the... Uh, blueberries. Any uh, tips oh. on blueberries? I'm sure we well, can get some info there. Blueberries have some <laughs> specifics. Some specific, very yeah. specific. They're picky. Um, they just take a, a lower soil pH than we normally have. So, you know, they're happy down around four and a half, mm-hmm. where, you know, neutral on the pH scale is seven. You know, a lot of our soils in central Illinois are seven or a little mm-hmm. bit above sometimes in urban areas and in places. So... Uh, it really just starts with planning ahead, definitely a soil test at the mm-hmm. get-go, yep. and probably starting a year ahead with some soil amendment. Yeah. And that's that's kind of how I've had the best luck. I've tried it way ahead of time like that and had better luck than mm-hmm. yeah. trying to do it all at the same time. And as you have to stay on top of it, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's not kind of a one-time... Right add something and then it's good forever that was kind of my problem i did (laughs) i did a ton of work and then you know things got in the way but um containers have also been easier there's some smaller varieties Mm -hmm. out there now that are bred for containers Um, an alternative to blueberry that doesn't care so much about the ph is honeyberry it's a honeysuckle okay it's super cold cold hardy it's kind of an oval shape to it okay Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah since it's a honeysuckle you really can't (laughs) yeah so so relative of honeysuckle yeah and uh it's not invasive though and and yeah not invasive and sold as a fruit um you know another one is juneberry or the saskatoon is what they call it up in the northern parts of the country and uh it it grows here i just planted some last year a master gardener from vermilion county shared some with me i really appreciate that um and so we'll see how they do but um i just started some but they're hardy here uh they're you know a more northern species but uh doesn't require the acidification and and you can grow a crop with it now uh back to blueberries though if that is really what you want to try um with all these you know caveats thrown out there (laughs) there's all these things you have to pay attention to um you, you would need to definitely acidify the soil before you get the plants in the ground, and then yeah. you'd have to maintain that soil acidity over mm-hmm. time because, you know, the, the environmental conditions there are such mm-hmm. that it's, the soil is going to want to go back to a more basic right. state. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've had the best luck with that uh, using elemental sulfur. Okay. Yep. And that's a surface-applied yeah. material to, to maintain it over time. Mm-hmm. Um, and even at the time of planting, that's what I've used to incorporate in the soil. Mm-hmm. Um, peat is listed often as something to add uh, to the soil, mm-hmm. and I think that's a good amendment, but I don't think it quite gets the acidity down no. enough with just yeah. peat. It'll do, a, I think, um, yeah, they usually recommend you do like a half soil, half mm-hmm. peat moss back into the hole, and I think that does a little bit of that instant pH lowering, but yeah, the elemental sulfur is going to give you that long term. Really, the, the value of the peat, though, is it comes from the fact that these blueberries are in where they normally mm-hmm. came from, and their native range, where, where they mm-hmm. occurred at nature, uh, would have a much higher organic matter right. level in the soil. That, yeah, where they, true. So that's what the peat kind of does, is mimics the natural conditions as far as drainage, you know, mm-hmm. nutrient retention, all the other things Absolutely. that the peat kind of does. 
uh, but you need something else. So elemental sulfur is what I use. It's kind of the slow release mm -hmm. yep. version of something. And it, again, it's just a granular product. You can spread on the ground. You can mix in the soil. Uh, ammonium sulfate is its cousin that's yep. Um, yep. more synthetically produced. So that's not something for, that you can use in organic production. Uh, but it's a quicker shot of acidity. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, honestly, for blueberries, I've used a little bit of both because I've gotten to an emergency situation where my plants were suffering oh, and yeah. I needed ammonium Need sulfate to, yeah. to get that, and that could, Yeah, um, and that gives you some nitrogen too. So you can use nitrogen, that as kind of like the yearly um, fertilizer. So uh, so that's kind of the ins and outs of blueberries. Uh, the, the other thing that I've ran across with blueberries is that my well water is very basic and mm -hmm. I think I'm fighting against my oh, well water sure. to keep that acidity up. So that's another Good factor point. that even when you get a soil test and you start to figure out, mm -hmm. calculate how much pH I need to add, keep in mind you're... You're kind of wrecking it as yeah. you're kind of, yeah, yeah, <laughs> neutralizing it. Going so, against it every time. Um, a, a fix for that is to use rainwater. Mm -hmm. So if you can collect water in a rain barrel to water from, um, that's a whole other level of management <laughs> yes, too. Yes. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's an, a way to kind of fix that if you can save rainwater and problem is the time that we don't have the rain is the time of year that you need to water the most Absolutely. so yeah. they don't coincide well mm. well good t good tips don't be afraid to try blueberries you gotta you definitely yeah, gotta try and, it and, well yeah. and one thing i will say is once you get them established and once you kind of yeah. figure out your mm. acidity level you need to work work towards they are super productive mm -hmm. i mean pounds of blueberry per acre that you get is a ton and yeah. there's not a lot of pest and disease problems once they're yeah. gone and they're so. tasty they're super tasty so that's always yeah. good uh we've gotten some celery feedback she, kimberly said shoot she already ordered seeds she should have brought the book bought the book first <laughs> <laughs> but still got to try it and then we had a response here that, saying that they've grown celery with success both from seed and from seedlings and they said it's very slow to start so you just have to start it early and don't let it dry out. So huh. try that. So okay. You've got the yeah. seeds coming, Kimberly, so you may as well. <laughs> Might as well, <laughs> Might as well try all. it and see. Might as well experiment. Might see yeah. how it goes. Okay, we just have a couple of minutes left. So if anybody has any final questions, feel free to get them in there quick. But while we wait, any final thoughts on seed starting that we didn't get to well, i'm trying to think Last if there's anything that's a tricks. good tip mm. um, i know when i was a beginner i made a lot of mistakes <laughs> yeah Just trying to think back be... to some of the things that were major downfalls for me um well i can think of one with lights one yeah. of, if you some books will tell you you don't need the lights until the seedlings <laughs> come up but oh. i will tell you that the seedlings are going to come up when you're not looking right and yeah. If there's not extra light on them, they will stretch in a matter of hours, and you'll have these spindly seedlings. So I always turn my lights on. Yeah, I immediately. Do too, yeah. yeah, me too. Yeah. I'm, I've just always just so it's done ready. That. Right. I just figured the second that comes through the soil, I want light yes, on it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You know? yeah. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I guess another thing early on that kind of helps is to cover this tray with plastic before mm -hmm. they come up. That yep. mm -hmm. that makes it so you can kind of water it once and yeah. not have to do much. Thing. Yeah, we didn't really show the um, dome. Over the dome, yeah. That one over here. So yeah, if you buy a lot of times, if you buy a seed starting kit, they'll come with that plastic dome mm -hmm. that can just sit use on it. the top. Yeah, definitely use it so you can because if you don't have a greenhouse, you can create kind of a greenhouse mm -hmm. environment. And then once the seeds start to germinate, then you can take it off and start to grow um, like normal. You but. Take it off when about half of the seeds are up. Is yeah. when I take it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good tip. I mean, I think Good another tip. mistake I made is the, f the first time I ever started seeds, I tried to do them in a really sunny south window. Oh, and, yeah. you know, I wish it could work that way. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just not. An, they know, just get yeah. spindly no matter how much you turn mm -hmm. the pots. And it, yeah. It's just not like direct light on top of them. Right. So yeah. I, I wish it was that simple. But um, I, I've had it work to where I've got plants I could put out into the mm -hmm. garden. But it just it wasn't. You know, you read in a lot of books that maybe you could use a, a mm -hmm. really sunny windowsill and maybe for like one or two plants. Right. But if you're going to do very many and once you start filling that space, um, yeah, no, I haven't yeah. had great luck with that. I haven't it's either. Only. Lights was a game changer. That was yeah. the first thing I bought. And then the next thing I bought were the heat mats. And the heat mats really improved the speed of germination and the consistency. So yeah. I was getting just a lot more, more even, uniform. more uniform which makes the whole process go smoother and you get better product true. at the end. Very true. Awesome. Okay, a couple of last minute comments here. Jerry said, yes, on lights, there are a few seeds that require dark uh, to germinate. So if you've planted them deep enough at the proper yeah. depth, then that's usually pretty good. And then John had a comment too, that some seeds need light to germinate too. So if the seed packet mm -hmm. says to 
just scatter on the surface or uh, plant it very shallowly, then yeah, yeah that's usually kind of a tip off that they Great do need points. some light. So mm -hmm. Great mm -hmm. points. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. You had awesome questions today, and I hopefully you learned a lot about seed starting, and now you're excited that the, the time is going to be coming up here really soon to get some of these things started. So we thank you for joining us for Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We're back again on March 10th, so mark your calendars. We'll be back with a new topic and to answer all your gardening questions. So thanks, everybody, for joining us.